Hey there, Mark Ainley from The Piano Files here. We just had a few days ago uh, Record Store Day, and I told a story about when I came across uh, a pretty important record in my experience of listening to historical recordings. And I thought it might be more fun to, rather than just keep things to a post, I think I need to start doing some videos uh, telling some of these stories, because I think we all have our stories with some of the recordings that have really moved shaped us in musical experiences and all kinds of life experiences. And for me, being a historian of uh, historical you know, piano recordings, uh, there's a lot of stories, there's a lot of uh, impactful uh, events and records that have been, I think, uh, that have shaped my perspective on uh, music making. Some of them, I mean, I remember these formative experiences very, very clearly. So uh, what I thought I would do for this particular video is uh, I've got a few records stacked next to me. I thought I would share some of these, uh, some of these fantastic records, just tell a little bit about how I came across them and maybe uh, after in post editing, splice in uh, one of the key recordings uh, from, from the record so we can listen to it a bit in context. So, um, now, I first came across historical recordings. It was in, probably, it was in 84 or 85. It was before the summer of 85, uh, I remember. And it was when my piano teacher <clears throat> took me through her 78s uh, looking for a Horowitz recording of Beethoven's 32 variations. And we stumbled across Rachmaninoff playing a second concerto. And I was like, okay, wait a second. Composers playing their own music. Uh, how far back does this go? So I was intrigued by the whole thing. So I started reading books and then I started going through record stores and going to libraries, of course, because it was free. I was you know, 15 or so at the time. And uh, so not heaps of money uh, floating around at the time. So uh, I developed a really good technique for flipping through records, much better than anything I was able to do at the piano. Kind of unfortunate because if, I, if that was really transferable, I'd be a class virtual so. So uh, I had names from Harold C. Schoenberg's book, uh, The Great Pianists. Uh, and I started being able to recognize pretty quickly. My eyes kind of keyed in and could recognize, you know, hey, this looks like a nice historical thing. Even it was a, as I was flipping through, it kind of saw the difference between, you know, something really modern or something really cheap. Although some of the cheap older ones uh, also were really good. But one of the first fascinating ones that I came across, I remember, was this one. Uh, landmarks of recorded pianism, which, uh, of course, you know, looking at this and seeing the dates and seeing, you know, who's on there saying, excuse me, we've got, you know, Brahms and Debussy and Grieg and Sansons playing, you know, and who's this kind of cool looking lady over here. So, of course, I bought this for, as you can see, the uh, outstanding sum of $2.50. Uh, and, you know, was intrigued to hear Brahms playing, you know, on this cylinder, which of course, you know, here is uh, kind of a bit of a deceptive term to be using because uh, didn't really, you know, you don't hear a whole lot in this uh, really kind of uh, worn out cylinder. But I immediately was enamored by Ilona Ivanschitz, this lady over here, uh, and the story of her having, you know, coached with Brahms and then having retired uh, from performance and had no idea that some, you know, 30 plus years later, I would meet her grandson and uh, be able to do this online interview, which is on my YouTube channel with him, which is just so meaningful. And, uh, you know, hers is a legacy that I'm, I'm very, very interested in. And there are more recordings. That's a whole story uh, that we'll get into at some point, but uh, we definitely want to have everything of hers available. She's a phenomenal pianist. So, you know, here's like one of her official recordings. She's playing Brahms waltzes in 1903, recorded December 22nd, 1903. It's interesting how soon before Christmas uh, people would record back then. And anyway, uh, so I, I was just intrigued being able to hear Grieg and Saint-Saëns and, you know, ostensibly Brahms, at least hearing a voice that purports to be him. Um, so fascinating stuff. So that's always been one of my favorite recordings, just a really early one and produced by the great Gregor Benko of the International Piano Archives, to whom so many of us owe an incredible debt of gratitude um, for his International Piano Archives uh, recordings, as is this one, and as is the next one that we're going to listen to. But uh, yeah, there we go.
Ilona Ivanschitz. is another international piano archives one. And this is of uh, Joseph Hoffman. Now, uh, I had read Harold C. Schoenberg just raving about Hoffman and talking about his incredible playing and um, just, you know, no shortage of superlatives. And so I was naturally intrigued and wanted to hear something. But the first re records I found of Hoffman were piano roll recordings, which are incredibly poorly done on uh, the Everest label, just, they're terrible. Uh, even though I liked piano rolls at the time, and this is a whole other story uh, that I will get into with a feature on my website, um, exploring how they were made and uh, what they provide and what's lacking and so on. It's, it's an important topic, but uh, when poorly regulated, just like when you have a poor transfer of a 78 on an old record, you can't appreciate as much. So I, I came across Hoffman piano rolls, which, you know, didn't do much for me. And I also found some cheap record that featured some broadcasts when he was really past his prime, you know, a couple of concerto movements and so on. And it was, it was pretty awful play. You could hear he was just not in good shape. So I hadn't heard anything from his prime. And I'll never forget when I went into one of my favorite Montreal record stores. Um, this is a story I told on my Facebook post. Uh, and it was clear somebody had died or had moved into a home or something because there was this unbelievable record collection that showed up all of these international piano archives once, all of these historical pianists on a variety of labels, the complete Rahmaninoff edition on RCA. And they were all like, you know, three LP sets were $9. And, you know, everything was like 3 to $5 per disc. And it was, you know, going to be a couple of hundred bucks. And, yeah, again, I was 15, didn't have heaps of cash, 15, maybe 16 or 17 at this point. But still, you know, it was, even though it was very cheap and it was still pretty cheap back then, uh, you know, it was just a lot at once. So they, they would hold records for up to seven days and we wouldn't hold too many. So I really had to, you know, uh, be judicious in what I was going to take right away, what I was going to hold, if I was going to leave anything there and, you know, uh, just on the stacks and hope that nobody else would buy them. One of the first ones that I bought was this Joseph Hoffman Casimir Hall recital, because there is a Waldstein in here. And I remember my physics teacher, Mr. Greiner, who was really not a great physics teacher, but who would have known that this guy was, you know, covered in chalk and, you know, with these thick coat bottle glasses and so on. And I uh, spoke with a really unusual inflection and that uh, he was this historical piano recording expert. I don't know how we got on the topic. I don't know how it happened, but uh, I found out. And he would give the class a physics problem to solve. And I'd wander up to the front of the class and we'd talk for like 10 or 15 minutes. And he'd like download me before the internet. He, uh, you know, download me with information of, oh, you have to listen to Hoffman, you have to listen to so-and-so play this. And this recording of this is you know, great. And this recording of that. He's the one from whom I first heard that uh, the, Le, you know, Le Paddy Chopin first concerto on the Seraphim label was not Le Paddy. Uh, he told me all kinds of things. Like he really knew the background. And he was telling me, oh, Hoffman's Falstein, you've got to hear this. And so, you know, of course, I was very excited. It's like, oh, I get to hear it now. Um, and I was not expecting, uh, what's on this record. Uh, 
you know, I thought it would be, you know, the same, just that kind of clean, beautiful, elegant um, kind of thing that, uh, that Aaron C. Schoenberg was writing about. And then I put it on and here's this, you know, dark, more, you know, really growling, kind of performance that's just got all kinds of touches that were just unlike anything I had ever heard before. And I still remember sitting in my parents' living room in a, this sort of just lying over there in front of the record player. We had a Bang & Elephant system with these teak wood speakers, with these blue uh, fabric fronts, uh, really quite elegant. And I'm just looking at his face and listening to these sounds come out of the speakers thinking, you know, I read all these words describing this playing, and it still pales in comparison. And so what's it, how can we imagine how composers themselves play together? We're just listening, you know, we're reading words describing it. And until you hear the sound, until you hear the actual voicing and the inflection and what it is that these people were doing, we can barely even imagine. Uh, now, I don't agree with everything Hoffman does here. I think there's some tempo shifts in the third movement that, you know, I don't particularly like how he slows down at times and uh, I don't think it's quite necessary to hear the effect. And I have to say that it sounds much better now on the Marston label CDs than it does on these LPs. Uh, so we can hear a lot more. And I was still aware that I was listening to something completely otherworldly, um, really from another time and just recognizing that, uh, you know, we can imagine how it might have sounded for Chopin to play or this to play or Beethoven. But again, that's just our imagination. That's just what we think. And we can criticize what it is that we hear. But is there, can we necessarily state with absolute fact that we would be shocked if we heard what Liszt or Chopin or Beethoven did? Maybe we would, maybe we would. But I think the assumption that they would play to our current tastes is a mistaken one. So um, yeah, so this, I know I prefer, if I'm gonna to listen to, if I'm gonna be perfectly honest, I prefer his playing at the Golden Jubilee. Um, I think that's just an astounding performance. I couldn't find that one. That didn't show up in the collection, unfortunately, at that record store. So somebody local who had it uh, copied it on cassette for me and uh it took me years before i found my own copy but uh but anyway yeah very very happy i was to find this amazing set and to hear that incredible thing and i think the chopin fourth ballad was also the one where i realized wow you know this is just not at all what i could have imagined and what else is out there <laughs>
Well, in terms of what else was out there, in terms of shocking playing, uh, there was also Ignaz Friedman. And another, we might say, controversial pianist who, you know, again, you can read descriptions and you can hear people talk about, you know, his soaring phrasing and uh, the emphasis of uh, the, the places in mazurkas. And that was particularly what I found fascinating in Harold Sichenberg's book. And, you know, making a little bit of a mountain out of a molehill, perhaps, that, you know, he becomes really grandiose and, you know, large scale instead of these quaint little miniatures. And again, until I actually heard his playing, I had no clue. So um, once again, in that collection, same collection at uh, Cheap Thrills of all kinds of places to buy, um, you know, these most divine uh, records. Uh, recordings by the greatest pianist. I used to go around, uh, I had this little circuit that I would go around uh, from one side of Montreal to the other, uh, or the other way around, uh, at all these second-hand stores. And Cheap Thrills was one that sold mostly rock and alternative and all these other kinds of things, but they also had classical section. The good thing about going shopping there was they didn't know how to price things because they weren't specialists. So they were just kind of haphazardly guessed. And generally the stuff was cheaper, hence the name, you know, Cheap Thrills. But uh, sometimes not, sometimes too expensive. But fortunately, you know, this one, uh, when I got it, was, again, probably about 2 or $3. And I thought, ooh, volume one, I think that's Friedman. Uh, unfortunately, there was never a volume two or three or whatever. But this was uh, produced by Alan Evans uh, way back then. And it's to him. There's, a, there's his name on the other side, the bottom corner. Um, and it has the 12 mazurkas and some other Chopin pieces. And so I got to hear Friedman's mazurkas, finally. And again, there's what I read about, and then there's what I heard, and then there's the experience. And then, you know, one of the important things I find in listening to these recordings is not just listening once, you listen again, and you listen again, and you listen again. Because the first time, you may be in so much shock and perhaps even resistance because you're hearing something that's so against your preconceptions that you're not actually really present because you're so busy reverberating in this kind of shock of what it is that you're listening to and bursting apart of your preconceptions and your idea of you know what music making should be. So uh, I certainly listened a lot and have listened ever since. And I, I really love this final. And uh, I thought, certainly at the time, I thought I had to listen to it a while wonderful transfers and, uh, of course, superb playing of these epic circus. <laughs> So one of the other artists who 
I was introduced to through Harold C. Schoenberg's book was Alfred Cortot. And he spent a couple of pages, you know, anytime he spent more than a paragraph on somebody, you knew this was somebody who was kind of important. And he spent a couple of pages on Cortot, uh, including talking about his mistakes and the way you accepted the mistakes in his recordings, the way you would, you know, ignore a scratch on a first class painter's painting. You're looking at the art, you're not paying attention to the scratch on the surface. And I think the first Corto vinyl solo I came across, I came across some chamber music. And I think the first one that I came across was the Chopin Etudes. And being, you know, uh, still young and not, not knowing the music, actually, at that point, I was a little put off by, you know, the, the number of clickers. Uh, and also I thought the sound wasn't really great on the transfer that I had. Uh, so I, again, I'd found, I think I'd found that one at a lending library. There's this wonderful classical lending library. You could take stuff out for very, very cheap. I had a lot of historical stuff, but um, it was this set that really got me in love with Corto. Now this one I came across uh, through another teacher in my high school. And I think he's the one who told me about Mr. Briner being an expert. It was Mr. Warden, who I had never studied with, who was a wonderful guy. But, you know, he was this, you know, semi-chain smoking kind of tough guy who everybody adored. All of his students absolutely loved this guy. Well, he heard um, the degree to which I was interested. In. I don't know, again, how I found out. Maybe Mr. Briner told me about Mr. Warden being an expert. Um, I don't know that they were too friendly necessarily, but I think they knew. Uh, of their interests. And Mr. Warden invited me over one evening to listen to some records. He had this unbelievable stack. He must have like, you know, seen like my eyes pop out of, you know, like, like church hat pegs. Um, when I, uh, when I walked in, cause he had this floor to ceiling stack and impeccable. I wonder if he taught accounting or something like this, because I mean, literally everything was just like perfectly stacked and alphabetized and so on and in perfect conditions. So of course, I wasn't really touching anything. I was looking from a distance. I was very nervous. Um, but I remember this is when I first saw this box set of, is it seven LPs? Something pretty extraordinary. Um, and just thought, wow, you know, like they're doing such a good job. Some labels are doing such a good job of pervert preserving these historical um, recordings. And I believe he lent me this, and he also lent me a big Lepati box set, um, the seven LP set, which was another important one, which I won't discuss today. That'll be another time. But, um, but this, the transfers here are so warm that I could really appreciate Corto's playing so much more. Um, the transfers really do make a big difference. And I just started to listen more and more and just fell in love with Corto Chopin. And some of what I loved the most was uh, what I came to love was his Nocturnes, which uh, unfortunately he didn't record the complete set. But I remember that was some of what really struck me, especially with Opus 27, number one. And also listening to Opus 55, number two, which, uh, you know, Friedman's was the legendary recording and I was listening to Corto's and couldn't really pick out as much difference back then in my early years, but I thought, well, this isn't so shabby either. I mean, you know, the voicing sounds great. And it is a great performance. But I think one of the ones that stood out for me right away, and I remember it certainly did years later and has become one of my all-time favorite Corto recordings. So if I'm doing a demo, that's one of the, uh, like an introduction historical recordings, that's one of the first ones I put on, was the Chopin Impromptu number three, where his timing is just impeccable. Uh, He'll just, he'll go up on these runs and everything just evaporates and he pauses in these, um, he pauses at these moments where it's just almost like you, you're following the trail of cigar smoke or cigarette smoke and it just goes up and it just, all of a sudden it just goes around. Uh, and and uh, you're just like, oh, okay, that went there. And then all of a sudden he comes back. Um, so that, is one of my all-time favorites. And years later, uh, I would become uh, friends and work together with Brian Crimp, who founded the APR label, which was originally called Archive Piano Recordings and then became Appian Piano Recordings. Um, and uh, we were 
talking about this the first time we met, which was in May 1990. Uh, we had a correspondence for a year and then I uh, was doing my first trip to Europe to uh, search for Lepatty, lost Lepatty recordings. So this is a bit of a fast forward. I'm going to go back to the 80s. Uh, but we were talking about Courtois and I mentioned that recording and he just smiled and acknowledged that that was one of his all-time favorite recordings. And as it turned out, he had produced this record, which I then probably got later that year, a year or two later, um, on the HMV Treasury, with nine great pianists, great pianists of the world, not an unusual title. Um, and it featured two recordings by Courtois, one of which is that same impromptu, number three. And it was produced, I had no idea actually when I bought the, re this record, that it was produced by Brian Crook back when he was working at EMI in the 19, early 1970s. Actually, it would have been before 1970s. This was, I can tell you why I know he was working there before in the 1970s. This was one really annoying thing. A lot of these records don't have publication dates on them. I just don't understand why that's the case. But, you know, you'd think there would be right at the bottom a very clear, here we go. It's 1972. A lot of them don't. This one actually does, but you have to hunt for it. So it's 1972, and I know he was working at EMI in 1970 because he didn't think that Lepatti Chopin Concerto was Lepatti and had a blazing argument with his producer saying there's no way. Just upon listening to it, you could tell it wasn't Lepatti. <laughs> Lepatti's produced. Then the EMI producer uh, said, well, it's his name on the box. So uh, EMI, standing for every mistake imaginable. Uh, a lot of the time, not listening to Brian Cripp more as they should have done. So it's great that he went off and did his thing. But uh, yeah, so anyway, this one had Lepatti's, uh, a Lepatti recording, which we'll talk about in a second, but it had that wonderful Corto, uh Chopin third impromptu. I just think one of the best piano recordings ever made. <laughs> Thank you. 
So as I mentioned, this one had a Lepati recording, but I didn't have this one. This wasn't the first one in which I heard that particular Lepati recording. Now, my introduction to Lepati was through the Schubert E flat impromptu at his last recital and just seeing the words Dino Lepati's last recital and thinking that's a kind of morbid title. And I was intrigued by the life story and, you know, again, found what I could uh, in the second of shops, but it was all American pressings, generally CBS Odyssey, uh, terrible transfers, very muffled. And, you know, you could still hear there was great playing in there, but not to the degree that one would like. And I remember speaking with someone uh, in Montreal about Le Patty. And she said, oh, I've got everything of Le Patty. And I was like, oh, <laughs> tell me more. <laughs> what else is there? And she had, as it turns out, not everything, but she had this fantastic British set. Now, I'd heard the Chopin Sonata on one of those terrible Columbias, but the sound is much better on this. Not that I think at this stage I could necessarily hear fully what was going on. Probably closer to 86, 87 at this point. Um, but I was intrigued because this one had something that I, a couple of pieces that I hadn't heard on the other pressings. And this is specifically the list, Sonata del Petrarca and Ravel, Alberada del Grazioso. And this Ravel I put on and I just hear this volcanic playing, this vivacious, wild playing. And I, within the first few seconds, and I thought, oh, wait a second, well, that doesn't sound very sick here. So, you know, there's all this talk. Everything I was reading was just, you know, pulling at the heartstrings. Oh, he was so weak. He couldn't play the last Chopin waltz at his last recital. He played the Jesu Joy of Man's Desiring. And, oh, he struggled to do everything. And then you hear Alberetta del Grazioso, and you think, well, hold on a second, because this narrative is starting to fall apart here. Uh, I just realized he wasn't always sick. And I want to hear more of this. I want to hear this kind of play. So what else is there out there? So it was a combination of this record, this performance, and then me learning from Mr. Greiner about, uh, good old physics teacher, learning about uh, the Bruno Walter Society, Music and Arts, and other bootleg pirate labels, as he called them, uh, that were issuing live performances. So unsanctioned performances of artists playing pieces from broadcasts or concerts that they didn't officially record. And I thought, cool, there must be stuff of Lepati because he lived until 1950. And Mr. Greiner told me about you know, the Chopin not being authentic, but an authentic one was found. And he told me also about the Bach D minor and how wonderful that was, uh, which again, I eventually found. But I just assumed there would be a lot more. And I'm glad I assumed that because that's what led to me uh, doing my research. Of course, very disappointed that there wasn't more. Uh, on that same May 1990 trip, I did eventually get my hands on the Paddy's Bartlett Concerto, take it to EMI, again, operating under the every mistake imaginable principal who decided, you know, waited a year before uh, eventually listening to it and then deciding he didn't want to issue it. Long story short, they eventually listened to me 10 years later. So, um, and that's now widely available. But this record was responsible for me hearing Lepati's Ravel, which by the way, his, this, this, these list and Ravel titles, which show really, I think a different side of them, were only available in North America between 1954 and 56 on a 10 inch Columbia LP. And then again in 1981, when the Angel Records put out a four disc set uh, as a 30 year uh, after the Batty died tribute, died in 1950. EMI was always late again. They were always like releasing stuff a year after the anniversary. Um, and so all these Americans, like a lot of people in the US, listening to Lepati held the view that he was just, he was a weak pianist because they'd never heard the Ravel, they'd never heard the list or they'd never heard a good transfer of the, uh, of the Chopin Sonata. So until, uh, you know, unless you heard these and, you know, getting imports back then, it was, it was not as easy. So unless you heard, I think this Ravel, 
you could hold, I mean, if you were listening to American pressings, you were listening to a very filtered, uh, limited range perception of Le Patty. So again, I'm so grateful to, um, this is my own copy now, but uh, for having been able to borrow this incredible uh, British uh, album of Le Patty and to hear that jaw-dropping uh, Alvarado Gracioso. <laughs> The next pianist is one who has really changed my life and uh, who I've been on a soapbox about now for 30 plus years. And how I came across this artist was uh, quite unexpected. I was flipping through Gramophone magazine, I'm pretty sure one of the things I used to do on my Saturdays or Sundays when I was going uh, through Montreal's stores, stop by the magazine shops used to have magazine shops because people used to, you know, online didn't exist and people bought things, including magazines. And I would read Gramophone Reviews and Le Monde de la Musique and all of these other magazines that, you know, I can at that point pay five to seven dollars or eight dollars or whatever it was back, you know, 35 years ago. That was like more than double now. So uh, I would just stand there and occasionally flip through, see if there's anything worth, worth reading. And there was a very short summary review of... Ravel's piano music played by Marcel Mayer. And the reviewer was saying that this was the, her direct unfussy playing was the closest thing that that reviewer had heard to the piano roles as inaccurate as they were by Maurice Ravel, which we now know actually, so at least some of them were made by Robert Casa de uh, That's a bit of information that came out later, but there was something in how this reviewer just so quickly and succinctly articulated this particular flavor. And having heard Le Patti's Ravel at this point and heard others just completely pale in comparison, I wondered, wow, you know, I'd really be interested in hearing this very different take on Ravel. So I remember I was walking from, you know, my usual opposite route uh, from one side of the town to the other. And so I went into the new record store, um, a and &A, which I would later uh, have a part-time job at. And I flipped through looking for this EMI reference uh, LP of uh, Marcel Mayer playing with L, and they didn't have it. What they did have was this, Marcel Mayer playing Chabrier, 
now in my high school band, we played Chabrier's Espana. And I was like, mm, I don't know what the kind of music this is going to be. Uh, but I just remember looking at this garish colored cover and, you know, pretty cheap, you know, just mass produced, like recopied lettering and all of that. But I just looked at the, the elegant face and posture and demeanor of this lady with this beautifully elaborate piano over here. And remembered that review and I thought, okay, what should I do about this? And the price was $30. Now, $30 in the late 1980s would be closer to 90 or 100 right now. So as a university student at this point, I was like, oh, no, this, is, this is a little, this is pushing it a bit. But again, you know, that review just stuck in my head. There's just something that struck me. So I thought, okay, I'm going to splurge. So I splurged and I brought this home and I remember being in my room. I remember unwrapping it. I remember putting in you know, a very thin record on the turntable, super thin. These uh, EMI uh, France records at the time, right. super thin and very lightweight and putting it on and hearing the sound that this woman produced come out and thinking, okay, well, I can imagine what the Ravel would look like, but this is it. There's, there's something to this pianist. Uh, and I just need to get everything that I can. And at that time, only four sets. Yeah, my reference had come out with only four sets. Nothing on CD at this point. And uh, it was a, couldn't really special order. It would have been very expensive to order from overseas at that point. You know, it didn't have a fax. You would have had to phone. It, it, was, it was complicated. Right? Life before online was very, very different. I'm glad I learned how to do my research then, but it was much harder. So um, I thought, oh, what can I do? What can I do? Um, well, I went to school with a, a gal whose mother worked at the CBC, Canadian Radio, Montreal. But, you know, you could not take stuff out from there. It was not easy. But she was kind of the head of the English department uh, of the CBC there. Uh, and so she did take it home for me, and she was going to record it there for me because she shouldn't, you know, be letting it out. But I went over once, and her daughter was there. She's like, oh, just take it. She won't notice. Uh, so I did, and I copied it on cassette quickly. It took the rebel home. It, of course, completely enamored. And it was years later before I got it on LP. EMI France started putting out Marcel Mayer's recordings on CD pretty comprehensively. Then, you know, I think around 2008 was when the, uh, the, later, the complete 17 CD box set came out with some stuff that had never been issued since. And uh, by that time, I'd met her, um, her um, younger daughter, the older passed away and I never got to meet her. Um, and I've just been a proponent of Mayer for a long time. I've written you know, several magazine articles for her. Her daughter is thrilled, as am I, that people now really know uh, what an astounding candidate she was. But this was my introduction. And Harold C. Schoenberg came to Montreal in 1988. Um, I used to occasionally write to him, ask him some questions. Uh, care of the New York Times and then got his address and occasionally wrote to him and I asked if he'd ever heard of her and he said no. So I sent him a cassette and included a few samples, included some Remo, um, definitely some Bell and some of the Chabrier. And he wrote back and he said, oh, I'm going on a trip soon, but I, I'll look forward to hearing this soon after. And then two days later, I got another note from him saying, I couldn't wait. And he was just completely enamored and said, he's in my debt for having introduced him to her. Uh, and I think I've introduced her to a lot of people since, and thank goodness for the internet now and other labels and EMI France continuing to put out her, her recordings to the Tara label for releasing more. Um, you know, I just, I, her Chabrier still holds a very soft spot in my heart. Um, and it was two tracks in particular that stood out, Idil, which is just some really, Fascinating, quirky, strange, delightful music. And Feuille d'Alba, uh, which I just think is just one of the most beautiful pieces of music and performances ever. And as it turns out, Idil was the daughter whom I met 
um, was her favorite piece as well. So I was delighted to hear that some 30 years later. All right. So Marcel Mayer, somebody, uh, Chabrier, you know, music, beautiful music that should be played more. And of course, everybody should be playing more like Marcel Mayer uh, in their own way, the way that she played in her own. Last one I'm going to feature today is uh, Geza Anda, who I knew growing up from the Mozart Concerto Number no. Twenty One, the Elvira Madigan, uh, which I think everybody had on Deutsche Grammophon. Uh, it had been the soundtrack in some Swedish film, and it had a, a photograph from the movie Lady on the cover. And so, you know, I couldn't really recognize, you know, the quality of the playing at that time, but, you know, it was too modern for me. I was into historical stuff, but, so I wanted to hear older stuff. But um, I can't remember what I first heard of Anda that made me realize, oh, okay, there's actually in some of these recordings, there's some playing that's not, you know, that, that's above average. But when I was in the UK, I would go in London to this record store, Gramex, that was on, I believe it's Lower Marsh Road, right near Waterloo Station, uh, run by our super quirky chap. It was very funny. And some very nice people working there and real connoisseurs. And it was just this whole scene of people hanging out there and conversing and sharing things, uh, very strong opinions. And, um, he, you know, of course, British pressings of the Columbia records were easy to come by there because, you know, you're in England and a lot of them were made there, whereas you would never find these in North America. And so, you know, I saw this unbelievable cover. Look at, talk about a bold, you know, bold coloring, the likes of which, you know, you're 
rarely going to see now, and you know that very noble photo, and uh, and you know the Paganini variations in Etude Symphonique, and I thought, well, you know, Paganini variations. I remember reading about how Joseph Levine's was apparently so phenomenal. No recording of him playing that, unfortunately. And and uh, you know, never struck me as the virtuoso type. And then I heard this, and I thought, you know, how do you get this elegance? with this virtuosity like how is this even possible and i have since played this recording of either both the etude symphonique and the and the Brahms for at universities and of all the recordings that i've played it has been more than once when i play anda that students will say i'm ready to throw in the towel like i'll never be able to make a sound that to which my answer would be, you didn't know that was possible, and now you do. <laughs> so now, you know, listen carefully to what he's doing and do your best. You know, now you now you have something to aim for. Um, so this has long been a favorite, and I just I love the cover. This was his debut album. It was recorded in April 1953, and it would have come out, you know, I don't know how long after that, probably before the year was done. Uh, and I think, you know, Walter Legg was probably very happy to have um, a handsome European pianist who could take Lepati's place. So Lepati died at the end of 1950, having made very few recordings. Whole other reason, again, if we want to get into the Every Mistake Imaginable story. Um, I've written and talked about this a lot, but, uh, you know, it was really helpful to have this young firebrand kind of pianist uh, to be able to record uh, at for EMI and on the same label on the Columbia uh, branch, not the h branch. And all of Anna's recordings, and particularly the first ones that he made, um, I think are just jaw drop. So one of my all time favorite records and you know, with a pressing like this, you know, if Warner would really do what they need to do, like, Eloquence and Sony is doing for uh, RCA in Colombia, and you know Eloquence is doing with Decca and other labels, and Deutsche Grammophon is doing. Put out the records in box sets with original, you know, on CD with the original album covers. Come on, it's easily done, and uh, it's just a crime that it hasn't been done for Anda, because those recordings are just some of the best you'll ever hear. So, uh, so there we go. Absolutely ph phenomenal, phenomenal LP, one of my all time favorites. <laughs> Thank you for sticking through this video. If you did, you got this far. Uh, mm -hmm. Congratulations. <laughs> Hopefully you enjoyed the, uh, enjoyed the stories, uh, enjoyed the recordings as well. Uh, do you have any of these albums yourself? What are your thoughts? And maybe if you want to type into the comments, uh, what's an album that was really meaningful for you? And how did you come across it? And what's, what's so impressive and what really strikes you? About that performance, uh, about the performances on those records. Uh, feel free to comment below. 
Thank you for tuning in. I'm Mark Ainley, um, The Piano Files. You can follow me on Facebook, on Twitter, on Patreon. If you'd like to support my work uh, there on Patreon, I have a subscription platform there on three different levels. And of course, you can always donate on, uh, uh, higher than the top level, which some people have generously have done. And you'll get previews of these kinds of videos, of podcasts, of articles that I've written, and so on uh, there before I make them public, uh, like this video. All right. So once again, thanks for tuning in. Mark Hanley at The Piano Files. Happy listening.